So we're going to now construct confidence intervals. This is, this is another tool that we use to make predictions. So remember from our probability unit last chapter that approximately 68% of the observations fall within one standard deviation, approximately 95% of the observations fall within two standard deviations, and approximately 99.7% of the observations fall within three standard deviations. So here is data from a survey at LMC. So professors at LMC would like to estimate the proportion of statistics students at California community colleges who are also taking English. So as a project, they surveyed 320 students currently enrolled in statistics. And we don't know too much about their sampling and methods, but we'll um, assume, since they say at LMC or another school, that they were surveying students who attended different community colleges and just LMC. So of those, 207 were in an English class, and 113 were not in an English class, and those add up to 320 total. So we want the sample proportion for the number of yes responses. So this 207 out of 320 is our p hat as a decimal is 0.6469. If you wanted to make it a percent, you could say 64.69%. So this is our value from our survey. Since it was a pretty large survey, 320 people, we expect it to be close to the population proportion, but we know due to variety and variability and sampling that this is not what we expect the exact population value to be. So we want to check to make sure, do we have enough data? Do we have at least 10 responses in each category? And just eyeballing, I can see, oh, I had 207 yeses and 113 noes, since this is just a yes or no question. I know I definitely had 10 responses in each category. You can work through the calculations, n times p hat, 320 times 0.6469. That gives you the 207, which is definitely greater than or equal to 10. So we can check, check and say that one's okay. If we do n times 1 minus p hat, that's the 320 times 1 minus our probability. That's 113, also greater than 10. So we can check that off. So since both calculations are greater than 10, a normal model is appropriate, and we have enough data. And I put a note here. Notice that the rounded calculations match the counts of yes or no in the table of the responses in the survey. So if you're working with two answer survey questions like this, it's sufficient to check to make sure do I have at least 10 responses in each category. So in this case, we don't know the population parameter. So we want to estimate the standard deviation. So we call this the standard error equation. It uses statistics instead of population values. So we're going to use p hat instead of p here. n is still the total number in the survey. So p hat is 0.6469, n is 320. We can work through this calculation for the standard error. We multiply, divide, and then square root at the end, and we get 0 0.0267 as our standard error. The standard error is going to measure how much the graph is stretched or compressed, the graph of the normal distribution, stretched or compressed. In the same way that the standard deviation does, the difference is that the sample error comes from sample data. The formula um, for quantitative data, the standard error formula is a little bit different than the standard deviation formula to make up for the fact that a sample might not include extremely high or extremely low values. For proportions, the formula looks almost exactly the same, except we've got p hat instead of p. So our goal is to estimate a population proportion. So we want to try to make an estimate that falls within two standard errors of the center. And so using that fact, we construct what we call a 95% confidence interval. So I start with the sample proportion, and then I'm going to add and subtract two standard errors to get a range of possible values that I think the actual population value might lie in. So we've got here our sample proportion, 0.6469, and this symbol's plus or minus, meaning we're going to go through two operations. 2 times 0 0.0267. If we multiply this out, we get 0 0.0534. So you can check in your calculator. 0 0.06469 minus 0 0.0534 gives us 0 0.5935. This is our lower bound. 
which is 59.35%. The upper bound comes from adding, so we take our 0.6469 plus 0.0534, and we get 0 0.7003 or 70.03%. So how do we interpret this? So here is one way that we can interpret our interval. We can say we are 95% confident that between 59.35% and 70.03% of all California community college students enrolled in the statistics course are also enrolled in the English course. So what are salient features of our interpretation? First, our 95% is how confident we are in our methods or how confident we are in our answer. It's not saying 95% of the time this or that happens. It's saying 95% is how sure we are in the methods that we used. Here I use the percents to report out. You could have also used the proportion values. It doesn't matter whether you use a decimal or a percent. And the other important feature here is that our prediction is about all California community college students. We already know about these 320 students in the sample, so they would not be who we're making the prediction about. Our prediction is about the whole population of California community college students. So it's important to make that very clear that you're predicting about the population value, what we call a parameter in your interpretation. Here's another way you might interpret. You could say the confidence interval is the success rate of the method that produces the interval. To say that we are 95% confident the unknown proportion lies between 0.5935 and 0.7003 is shorthand for we got these numbers using a method that gives correct results 95% of the time. So when you write out confidence intervals, you want to use one of these structures to explain the meaning of your interval. It's important that you explain that we're predicting about the population proportion for all California community college students. You can choose as a user the confidence level. Typically we choose 90% or higher because we want to be quite sure of our conclusions. So let's think about what a 68% confidence interval would look like. Remember, 68% corresponds with one standard deviation. So this is 0.6469 plus just one standard deviation here. We get 0.6202 as our lower bound from subtracting and 0.6736 as our upper bound from adding. So as a statement, we can say we are 68% confident in our methods that between 62.02% and 67.36% of community college students in statistics are enrolled in English also. So again, we're predicting about all community college students, and that 68% is confidence in our method, not anything to do with the sample students. So now what if we want to be 99.7% confident? That corresponds with three standard deviations. So notice in the calculation, now we're multiplying the standard deviation of standard error, whichever value you're using. In this case, it's the standard error, I believe, right? Because it comes from sample data. So we multiply that by three. We call this the margin of error when we've multiplied the standard error or the standard deviation by however many standard deviations or standard errors we're counting. So here we can say our p hat value, our statistic, 0.6469, plus or minus the 0 0.0801, which came from multiplying our standard error times three. Subtracting, we find the lower bound is 0.5668, and the upper bound is 0.727 after rounding. So notice, this is wider than our 68% interval estimate because we are more confident in our answer. So if we're more confident in our answer, then we need more room for error or a larger margin of error. So we can say as a statement that we are 99.7% confident in our methods that between 56.68% and 72.7% of community college students and statistics are also enrolled in English. So again, our prediction is about all community college students, the population value. And again, that 99.7% is how confident we are in our methods. So question F asks us to think about which confidence interval is widest. So we see clearly from our calculations that 99.7% interval is widest since it includes three standard errors, right? It goes lower than the other intervals and it goes higher 
than the other intervals. So that makes it a wider interval. So we trade off higher confidence in our methods for a wider interval. So if we want to be more sure, there has to be more possible population values.